Hey everyone, back again. New place in LA, so I don't know. I'm gonna experiment with how to record and all that. But yeah, I'm back, at least for this, uh, which many of you have asked for. It's the presentation I gave for my, in my defense for my dissertation, and many people have asked for it. And eventually the document will be made available and you can download it for free. Uh, but if you're new here, hi, I'm David. I normally explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if that interests you, I mean, subscribe, like, you'll see videos are released every week. We'll try to be releasing every week. Uh, yeah, and if you're new here, you can see more than 300 episodes I already have up. Uh, you can help me out by liking, sharing, subscribing. You can help me monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but no pressure to do that. If you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram, TikTok, x twitter whatever all links in the description and uh yeah i'm going so i'm recording this as both a youtube video so if you're listening to the end of podcast so if you're listening to this as a podcast there are going to be accompanying slides which you can go check out if you want to see it on youtube but it's not totally necessary uh so if you found this on youtube and just prefer the audio then you will have that option available to you as well okay so yeah, let's jump right into it. Uh, firstly, I have to thank my supervisors, Tim Blackmore and Allison Hearn at the University of Western Ontario. You were so helpful for me uh, to actually to actually get this done. Uh, also, I'd like to extend like the biggest of all possible thanks to my partner Elen, who has been so helpful uh, for me, like on so many in so many different ways, from actually being able to put together something of this magnitude to actually learning about a lot of the theory that I employ here and just being uh, the greatest partner anyone could ask for uh, throughout this whole process. So to all of you, really, I, my, I cannot thank you enough. Uh, so really, this project is an effort to synthesize Jack Radich's conception of conspiracy theories as subjugated knowledges with intersectional feminism and critical race theory to understand the varying ways that conspiracy theories can contribute to or challenge hegemonic institutions and hegemonic status quo and oppression and everything like that. So like so many theses, this one has gone through many changes. I don't want to get into all the details of that. Like I was scouring ancient texts for way too long, looking for evidence of conspiracy theories, like as far back as the Bible and ancient Roman texts. And there are many examples of it. You don't actually have to look very hard. Uh, so the conspiracy theory is a long lasting thing. It's a perennial phenomenon. And really, uh, I think that there are many implications for us today thinking about that. Uh, now that's not something that'll really figure into what I'm doing here, but it was how I started. So from there, I really started to think about the conspiracy theory as being like conducted on the margins of society, being something that people who are who uh, like lack uh, any kind of real education conducted, I'm going to problematize this. But at first I was like, oh, of course, it's conspiracy theories are conducted by, you know, people in their parents' basement with those with the cork board and the, you know, all the little uh, thumbtacks and they're drawing connections and they're string everywhere, you know, the tinfoil hat type thing. But what I found is that that's not, you know, that's not really the case. Uh, and we can find that like throughout history, like thinking about Nazi Germany, for example, and to just jump to my first slide, if I can, um, what we actually see or saw, or that not this slide, this is, uh, I thought this was a funny comic from the New, York, uh, the New Yorker, where it says that for those of you listening, uh, there's an image of a person standing on a slanted hill with a ball rolling down the hill and the caption reads the flat earth actually has a two degree slant which i thought was funny even if it doesn't exactly fit with my argument in any case though we know about the horrors inflicted or at least motivated by fostered by uh conspiracy theories and conspiracy thinking so like like hannah arendt writes here in um from the origins of totalitarianism as she writes, it is well known that the belief in a Jewish conspiracy that was kept together by a secret society had the greatest propaganda value 
for anti-Semitic publicity and by far outran all traditional European suspicions about or superstitions about murder and well poisoning, which are just examples of anti-Jewish uh, conspiracy theories that really have been around for millennia. So in this context, at least with Hannah Arendt, we know that the conspiracy theory is not just something that happens outside of like political power, outside of academically inclined circles. In fact, it's something that has been and continues to be used by people in power, by people with a lot of authority, by people with a lot of reputability. And in many cases, conspiracy theories are a way to consolidate their power. So really, what are the data about conspiracy theories? Well, in 2014, uh, Joseph, Joseph Wyszynski and Joseph Parent uh, released their book titled American Conspiracy Theories, in which they present the following data really about the ubiquity of conspiracy theories. Some of these data are featured um, here. Again, a little pause as I bring up my actual talk. So conspiracy theory belief, belief they found uh, is really surprisingly consistent across the gender spectrum uh, between conservatives and liberals in the states, uh, the United States, um, between the educated and the uneducated, academically so I should say, and across generations. Now there are some variations, like people who are more academically educated are, there's a little bit, uh, they're a little less likely to believe in conspiracy theories, but of course it depends. Uh, across generations, older people are likelier to believe in conspiracy theories than younger people, but really the difference is not very significant. Uh, Uzinski and Parent also found that uh, in the case of like older racialized people, they are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories in the States. They don't really provide evidence for this claim, but in any case, they hypothesize that it could be because um, older racialized people, especially black people in the United States, of course, with experiences of segregation, Jim Crow laws and institutional racism, like they'd be more likely to draw upon conspiracy theories to understand their situation, which is partly what I'm going to argue here, uh, albeit with a lot more attention to this, um, to this phenomenon. Now these data really encouraged me to rethink my understanding of conspiracy theories as like fringe phenomena, you know, just happening on the margins of society. And it, it forced me, or these data forced me to pose two questions to myself. Either these data reveal that, or pose two hypotheses to myself. Number one, either these data reveal that the oppressive tendencies that accompany conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorizing are much more ubiquitous than I had originally thought, or conspiracy theories uh, do not only circulate to intensify oppression, you know, articulated by uh, people with, um, trying to maintain a hegemonic status quo, but might actually be used by marginalized folks to call attention to power, call attention to oppression. So my research would eventually push me to accept the second hypothesis as being the most likely. But in confronting this fork in the road, I encountered a new dilemma. And that is, if conspiracy theories are ubiquitous, really, Yuzinski and Parent show that like, 50%, at least 50% of the American public believe in at least one conspiracy theory. They are really ubiquitous phenomena. If we account for their ubiquity, just how common they are, what does this mean for knowledge production? What does this mean for expertise today? Now with the advent of social media, it seems as though we've entered a new phase of epistemic relations where someone with a YouTube channel focusing on medical issues, for example, can be taken as seriously or more seriously or with more legitimacy than someone with a medical uh, degree who is offering conflicting advice, which is certainly what we saw during COVID with um, anti-vaccine rhetoric, uh, although we will come to contextualize these types of fears uh, as we go on. So in their book, a lot of people titled, a lot of people are saying Rosenblum and Weirhead situate this phenomenon more precisely, that is the uh, kind of the death of expertise, the end of legitimacy, they locate this within the Twitter age, in which they say that, you know, anyone with an opinion can share that opinion online and have it be taken seriously, depending on how many people share it. So if people are inclined to believe something that's not true, if it fits with their worldview, they will come to share it just for the sake of sharing it. And by virtue of that, it will gain legitimacy, and it will more likely be believed to be true. 
So what they say is that we have entered a new kind of conspiracy theorizing today, where we have gone away from what they call classic conspiracy theories into conspiracism. So one of their quotes here I will put up for us all to see. And here's the cover of their book for those of you that are listening or uh, watching, I should say, on the YouTube. So as they write in their book, conspiracy theory is not new, uh, of course, but conspiracy, conspiracism today introduces something new. That is conspiracy theory without the theory. And the new conspiracism betrays a new destructive impulse, and that is to delegitimize democracy. So what they are doing here, and I don't want to focus on this too much, it's actually the topic of um, a, a forthcoming peach, uh, book chapter, which, so I might do a whole episode just on that. Uh, so what they're doing here is effectively saying that there was once a time when conspiracy theories were legitimate. There were people who were putting together uh, information, drawing connections, drawing conclusions, and because they used these methods, they were more legitimate and uh, should be taken more seriously, whereas today, conspiracy theories are just spread, they're developed through insistence by saying like, oh, you know, a lot of people are saying this, so it must have legs. Instead of like actually hunting for data, playing an investigator, trying to fit the pieces together, apparently people aren't doing that these days. And so we have entered into this new conspiracism. Now, their claim, or at least their understanding about the conspiracy theory based on its possible legitimacy, based on how truthful it might be, how rigorous its methods are, the, the, this idea is not new uh, for them. I mean, other people have been saying this type of stuff uh, way before uh, Rosen, Rosenblum and Muirhead. Now, some of these people include, as I, again, have to bring back up my... I'm sure there's a better way to do this, but I don't have the time to, <laughs> to figure it out. So, for example, there's uh, Cassar Sunstein and Adrian Vermeule. Uh, who problematically and regrettably suggest that conspiracy theories are a form of, in their words, a crippled epistemology that stems from a sharply limited number of relevant informational sources. Additionally, Brian L. Keeley makes a distinction between conspiracy theories and unwarranted conspiracy theories. There's legitimate ones and illegitimate ones. For Keeley, unwarranted conspiracy theories are devoid of any evidence and reason and should therefore be disavowed. Now, Keeley does not support other somewhat substantiated conspiracy theories either, which he sees as embodying a thoroughly outdated worldview. And this is so common. The conspiracy theory is treated as something that needs to be proven, needs to be like, um, needs to legitimate itself in order to be taken seriously. Now, what this does is it essentially brackets off any discussion about the conspiracy theory beyond what, uh, whether or not it is truthful. For instance, considering the other types of connections that conspiracy theorists make or the way that they understand the world, how conspiracy theories are like almost a kind of storytelling where like tales and urban legends, sure, they might not be true, uh, it, you know, empirically verifiable, but in any case, they can tell us a lot about our world, which is where I'm going with this. Uh, more specifically, trying to open up a discussion of conspiracy theories that doesn't just hinge their validity or their being worthy of study on whether or not they are true. Now, in the face of approaches such as these, I turned to Jack Bradich's book titled Conspiracy Panics, which I've actually, um, I haven't covered the whole thing on this channel, but I've covered like the term conspiracy panics. So if you're interested in that, you can go and find uh, the episode I've, I've done on that. So in this book, and it's really, uh, it's really an important text. Jack uh, was actually on my examining committee for, for this project. So I got, I was lucky enough to get to speak with him and actually understand uh, more about his approach. But I really view this text as being a turning point within conspiracy theory research and one that's not taken quote, nearly as seriously as it should be. So what uh, Jack Bradich does here is he really shows or disaggregates the study of conspiracy theories from their possible truth value. Instead, he says that conspiracy theories don't just like exist out there in the world. They aren't just like waiting to be uncovered and waiting to be proven true or false. Instead, he calls our attention to legitimating institutions, including in his words, reputable media companies, academ academia, government bodies that participate in what he calls 
liberal political rationality that calls for a moderate suspicion when well within the boundaries of a regime of truth. So it encourages properly moderate self-reflection that assumes the form of self-policing and liberal self-correction. These institutions participate in establishing a norm around what should, what should and what should not be said. So one of its tactics, that is liberal political rationality, one of its tactics is to label unsavory or undesirable ideas or explanations of events or phenomena as conspiracy theories, which is a term of derision of disqualification and of dismissal. So he's saying that conspiracy theories are not just something that we can just see in the world. Instead, they are a category of knowledge that is used to discredit some people's experiences and to discredit some people's knowledges just right off the bat without actually looking at the evidence, without actually looking at you know the other meaningful elements of it, just looking at their truth value, really understanding them in terms of their truth value. So. Bradditch was very much influenced by the work of Michel Foucault, uh, specifically the idea of subjugated knowledge. So here he suggests that subjugated or conspiracy theories are an example of subjugated knowledge. They represent knowledge that is a dialectical, almost dialectical antithesis to legitimate forms of knowledge, not because these things exist out there in nature, but instead legitimate forms of knowledge are those that are considered as such attain their status not only through uh, persuasion or coercion, but by deliberately creating an antithetical point or an antithetical form of knowledge that legitimate knowledge can use to be like, oh, we're legit because we know the bad knowledge is over there. We know what it looks like. It looks like conspiracy theories. It looks like conjecture. It looks like, you know, the tabloids, yada, yada, yada. So here, Subjugated knowledges serve as counterpoints to lend comparative legitimacy to official accounts. So by characterizing them in this way, Braddich is able to look beyond their substantive differences within conspiracy theories and focus instead on their common treatment by official regimes of knowledge and uh, production and dissemination, allowing him to link seemingly disparate groups, specifically who he focused on, and this was written, a lot of this was written in the 90s, uh, but came out in 2008. So he was focusing on African-Americans, militia groups, and political extremists, and their use of conspiracy theories, and they're being disqualified for using conspiracy theories. So he homogenizes them or says that they are all examples of subjugated knowledge because they are all branded as conspiracy theorists. Now, he says more than that, that they are unified, not because they are branded as conspiracy theorists, but they are unified in their common struggle against elites. Now, while I'm initially resistant to the effort to just clump these groups together, given that given their varying histories, like militia groups certainly being a, uh, really resonating with uh, white supremacist, xenophobic ideals, uh, he, he insists that, you know, these groups were gendered and raced in um, many different ways. And so therefore, they aren't like the oppressive reactionary groups that they are often made out to seem. In any case, I still think that, uh, you know, we, we now know that these, these groups are hardly representing, uh, you know, they aren't exactly lining up to teach about critical race theory or take courses about critical race theory. Many of these groups align themselves with um, many reactionary sentiments that, and um, contribute to anti-black and anti-Hispanic racism in the States and anti-Muslim uh, racism. Like, of course, all of these things, uh, <laughs> the, these alliances aren't quite as neat as Bradditch lays out here. But in any case, his point is very important in that he provides us a starting point to understand conspiracy theories, not as like existing out there, but as being instead a category created to disqualify some knowledges over others. So I'm more interested then in taking that as a starting point and then contextualizing it within a broader economy of legitimating institutions and practices that accounts for other forces of oppression, not just legitimating ones that try to attain uh, epistemic superiority or that try to make themselves seem more legit. I also want to consider how 
white supremacy, how patriarchy, how you know, anti-black racism also connect here, how sexism connects here as well as other forces that disqualify some knowledges in very specific ways as we will come to see. So given this, we have to account for the ways that some voices and figures being branded, despite being branded as conspiracy theorists, are hardly subjugated. So like there's of course Donald Trump, whose use of and condemnation for his use of conspiracy theories during his ascendancy to the highest political office in the world, uh, you know, he used conspiracy theories and was branded a conspiracy theorist. It hardly made him, his ideas, hardly subjugated those ideas. So we all remember like, or maybe we don't all remember, but he was, he once uh, joined Alex Jones on his show, talked about how much he appreciates Alex Jones and everything like that, which of course, uh, is a sign that the conspiracy theorist is not just like this subjugated figure who is unable to express themselves or always experiences a kind of resistance when they express themselves. So I see it necessary then from this point to introduce other forces into the equation. Uh, these include, like, like I mentioned earlier, anti-black racism, patriarchy, classism, to understand the varying ways that conspiracy theories are condemned and subjugated. Now to set the stage for an engagement with such variations, I begin chapter two by contrasting Alex Jones's conspiracies on his site InfoWars with those of the Warao people in colonial Venezuela who suffered immensely from a cholera outbreak in the early 1990s. And I have a, an image of their geographic region in South America here if you're interested. It's not, you can always Google it if you're, if you're curious but where they are geographically. So highlighting examples from both Alex Jones and the Warao people, I argue that although they were condemned on the basis of using conspiracy theories by many different people, and therefore belonging to the camp of subjugated knowledge that Bradditch describes, Jones's conspiracy theories maintain a hegemonic status quo, and so he's able to benefit from it. Whereas those in the case of the Warao people, their conspiracy theories resulted in their being even more oppressed, being even more uh, subjugated by the Venezuelan government and medical authorities and everything like that. So their conspiracy theories called attention to the very structures of medical care or lack thereof that contributed to their suffering immensely from cholera, which is a very treatable disease in the early 90s. So some of the conspiracy theories that we find here, at least by the Warao people, uh, I, I include one example here and I'm gonna read it, but there's also a slide for it. Um, oh, next slide. Actually, no, I won't do that because I'll get, it'll, it'll mess up. So in any case, if we're gonna, there's a quote on the screen that doesn't match what I'm about to say because I just know I won't be able to go back later. So. Uh, one local resident, uh, Awisadatu, who is a healer named uh, Hinaro Romero, explained the breakout of cholera as follows. We said that this is a Criollo disease. That is its origin. The Criollos made it and its owners are the people from Trinidad. That's what we heard. It's said that they brought more and more and more and more crabs from there in Mariusa. But then what happened? The owners of the crabs, it said, didn't want to go get them. It appears that they hadn't been paid. Okay, fine. So right then they started putting poison in the water for the crabs. They kept on making poison. Then the black people, in this case, the Trinidadians left. So the Mariusans in turn went and got crabs and ate them, see? But they had become bad. Maybe that's why they made the poison. That's how it happened. And I include other, cons like other examples in the actual project, but this is just one to illustrate that, you know, there are conspiracy theories here. In response to these conspiracy theories, uh, such as these, the Venezuelan government and medical professionals took them as evidence of the Warao people's lack of scientific knowledge and is therefore somehow deserving of their suffering from cholera. As Charles Briggs writes, if getting cholera demonstrates that individuals and communities lack scientific knowledge, telling conspiracy narratives further proves their pre-modern status by showing that they cannot distinguish scientific and social spheres. For the Warao people, these are the stakes of being branded a conspiracy theorist. 
that is a continued erasure by government medical professionals, you know, lack of adequate care, and uh, an intensified belief in there not being um, as like academically or as enlightened as their uh, colonial counterparts, which of course has a long history here uh, in, in uh, anti-indigenous racism. Now, we can juxtapose such an example with any number that we saw or can find on Alex Jones's site, Infowars. Like one that I uh, focus on is um, from one contributor who said that following uh, George Floyd's murder that led to many of the Black Lives Matter protests in 2020, uh, this article reads, the media is doing everything in their power to act like these riots are not happening because they're, they know it will hurt Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, who worked tirelessly all year to fan the flames of anti-white racial hatred and resentment and even encourage people to donate to a bail fund to bail out the rioters and looters caught in the act. Now, for Alex Jones and his Infowars contributors, the threat posed by anti-racist activists to white people eclipses the repeated harms inflicted against people of color in the United States, including through police violence, through lack of uh, or denial of adequate health care of uh, communities in certain areas living in food deserts because they are, you know, they go down racial lines and because of segregation, uh, having this effect, like, for some reason, anti-white racial hatred is what is taken seriously in this context by Alex Jones and his contributors, and not, of course, accounting for the ways that black people are treated how they are, how they experience um, way more racism, yet that doesn't seem to be a concern, demonstrating their alliance with uh, whiteness and white supremacy. Now, while Alex Jones is branded a conspiracy theorist by politicians, media pundits, and academics, and so on, his experience as a conspiracy theorist differs greatly from that of the Warao people just mentioned. So his use of conspiracy theories is not used as evidence of his pre-modern status or his implicit cognitive inferiority uh, on the basis of his race. Rather, it reflects his attachment to white supremacy and patri patriarchy in the U.S. So this might be why between uh, 2013 and 2014, uh, he made more than like $15 million on the sale of his supplements alone, which is a wild, a wild figure. Now, between the Warao people's conspiracy theories and those of Alex Jones and his colleagues, there's a breach in, in the assumed equidistance of these conspiracy theories from legitimating institutions and as being subjugated knowledges. So to put it simply, it seems as though Alex Jones's conspiracy theories uphold an oppressive status quo, whereas in this case, the Warao peoples actually call attention to such institutions or such a status quo. So what's going on here? What other factors should be considered when engaging conspiracy theories and the various ways that they are policed and prosecuted? To grapple with the distinction, I turn to the feminist work and critical race theories of Kimberly Crenshaw, Gloria Ann Zaldua, Sarah Ahmed, and Nicole Charles to nuance my understanding of conspiracy theories as subjugated knowledge and to distinguish those that contribute to dominant oppressive structures from those that call attention to such structures. Moreover, I found that more than just calling attention to such structures, the conspiracy theory can be a useful tool to teach about the concentration of power and the need for marginalized communities to embrace some degree of suspicion, which is me borrowing from Nicole Charles, to anticipate possible threats that may otherwise appear innocu innocuous. Now, I've covered all of these thinkers on this channel, if you want. Uh, I really recommend Nicole Charles's book, Suspicion. I've covered it on here. I actually had her on to talk about it. I highly recommend it. She's so articulate. The, her ideas are, are profound. And um, yeah, she's a, a force to be reckoned with in, in, uh, these, in, in, on this topic, like really w w without parallel. And I'm going to talk about her more as we go on here. But yeah. So in the, in the case of the conspiracy theory, and I was, I was asked this in the defense itself, like what is it about the conspiracy theory that allows us to understand power relations in ways that other narratives don't. And that is because the conspiracy theory always implies some kind of power. It implies that people have, in a lot of cases, more power than they actually do. And so it is by virtue of that, that it is, it opens us up to a certain potential to understand power relations, 
Now, the, 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 I should be very clear. Conspiracy theories are not like a magical way to oppose power. Like I'm like I'm think I'm being very clear. In many ways, it can be used to encourage uh, violence. They can be used to encourage oppression, to intensify oppression, like in the case of anti-Jewish conspiracy theories. Like, of course. And the point is not to say that they're like a magic antidote to power. Instead, it's about engaging with them more holistically to be able to have or to understand the varying ways that they contribute to and perhaps even challenge power. So the conspiracy theory can challenge power, like especially when confronting systemic forms of oppression that by virtue of their repetition, systemic forms of oppression and their repetition and their being really ubiquitous, they enjoy some status of transparency. So systemic oppression can actually veil itself in its being omnipresent, in its being everywhere. So it can be difficult to actually identify. It's like explaining what water is to a fish. So for some, the conspiracy theory may be a way to articulate and to identify forces of oppression that might otherwise be more difficult, more ephemeral, uh, you know, harder to actually understand and to illustrate. So I saw this to be the case, and now we're finally on the slide that I brought up earlier. I saw this to be the case as I was closely reading Kimberly Crenshaw's Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, you know, a pretty, <laughs> her super important essay that really opened the door for intersectional uh, feminism and intersectionality. And, and she really made, made it famous in that, in that essay. So when she writes that the end result, where in this text, she writes that the end result of any combination of oppressive forces against any number of discernible identity markers is greater than the sum of racism and sexism on their own. And so no standard arithmetic can quantify these forces, as she suggests with regards to black women's experiences, they do not experience racism and sexism, as though you can just add the two. Instead, they experience something beyond that. They experience the world as black women, which is goes beyond a standard arithmetic, goes beyond a standard addition of just being black in the experience of oppression there and as being a woman in the experiences of oppression there. So this is a very, I, you know, this is a very mysterious moment in the text, in, in her text, but I saw it necessary, like, in, in reflecting on this moment to leave open a consideration of the difficult to grasp artic articulations of oppression that evade standard approaches to understanding oppression, understanding its force, understanding how it affects people, and so on. So maybe then, maybe in some measure, the conspiracy theory can be a way to articulate this unaccounted for remainder, that which goes beyond just the standard arithmetic, as an embodied expression of experiences of oppression that evade traditional forms of speculative inquiry. So we see this on display, at least I think, in Gloria Enzaldúa's Borderlands La Frontera, in which she generously offers us insight into a tool handed down to her from her ancestors called La Facultad which she defines as the capacity to see in surface phenomena the meaning of deeper realities. So la facultad is the capacity to see the subterranean structures that maintain a given system's power, and it requires then, in the face of this power, it, it, it requires or it encourages among people who have the power to see it, an elevated sense of vigilance against these surreptitious forces of oppression. So she writes that when we're up against the wall, when we have all sorts of oppressions coming at us, we are forced to develop this faculty so that we'll know when the next person is going to slap us or lock us away. So in this context, the fear Anzal Dua describes differs from the ostensible fear felt by like Alex Jones, for example. So as Sarah Ahmed writes, in the case of fear, fear is an embodied experience. It creates the very effect of the surface of bodies. But an obvious question remains, which bodies fear which bodies? Of course, we could argue that all bodies fear, although they may fear different things in different ways. But I want to suggest that fear is felt differently by different bodies, in the sense that there is a relationship to space and mobility at stake in the differential organization of fear itself. So here you might recall, maybe, Frantz Fanon's description of his fear of a small white child. So Frantz Fanon being a black man uh, from Martinique. In his text, Black Skin, White Mask, he, he describes a moment 
in which he sees a young white boy who seems to be scared of Fennel being a black male adult. And this is in the 40s or 50s, this, this moment happened for him. Uh, and in that moment, he experiences fear of the child because he knows that if the child cries or screams, he might get arrested or he might get attacked uh, just for existing in the world. He's not doing anything wrong. And so in this moment, there's two kinds of fear or two people are experiencing fear. The child is scared of Fennel because the child has internalized a racist idea about black men. And Fennel is experiencing fear of this child. Now, in this case, like if we're looking at this, like surely Fennel has no reason to actually be scared of a little child. What harm could the child do to him? The point is instead that fear extends beyond the actual experience within a given person and also attaches itself to various lines of defense that will protect that fear or that will act upon that fear. So in that case, Fanon doesn't have a justice system on his side. He doesn't have police on his side. He doesn't have the people around him on his side. He is alone in his fear. And so fear is not the same in all contexts. And even in places where it might appear the most legitimate in the case of this child, like certainly a child's fear is the most pure. And of course, uh, it hasn't been socialized, but we find right here that of course it is. And of course we have to account for these differing kinds of fear. So the effects of fear are not universal. And the ways that fear is understood and circulated within a specific economy of power relations varies depending on who's experiencing the fear and who's making someone fearful. The same applies, I argue, to conspiracy theories. Who, um, whose fear is expressed in a conspiracy theory is legitimated and whose is not? To answer this question, I saw it necessary to return to, not to return to a quest for truth, that is not to frame the question around whose concerns are more empirically verifiable, are more like empirically legitimate. Like for example, we find this really important passage in Paul Gilroy's The Black Atlantic, when he describes the ways that organized violence against black people or evidence of it, uh, evidence of it are generally found in sources that are both more imaginative, imaginative and ephemeral. That is, in the case of systemic oppression targeted against racial minorities in this case, or a target against marginalized folks in this case, the types of evidence that are often required to attain the status of legitimacy by various inst institutions isn't made available because people weren't keeping records of violence inflicted against uh, black people. Or if they were, they could hide these records. They were written by the aggressors themselves, not by the people who were victimized. So already, those accounts, those histories are, have been filtered through, in many cases, the voices of the aggressors themselves. So it's not to say that there can't be, you know, finding legitimacy here, empirical verification. Of course, that's all super important. The point is to also consider the other side of the coin as well, to consider how experiences of oppression and embodied responses to oppression might not always be like verifiable. And so we have to not use that as the only metric to understand oppression. So treating empir empirical verification as a panacea or, or an all cure, as a miracle cure, to this tenuous search for truth obfuscates the many ways that empirical validation and the reliance on historical accounts, figures, statistics, participates in the very kinds of oppression that we're seeking to undo. So drawing now from Nicole Charles's important work on vaccine hesitancy in Barbados, well, in the term is suspicion, not hesitancy in Barbados. I see it necessary to move away from empirical verification as a sole measure of legitimacy to instead consider in her words, embodied narratives of suspicion, gut feelings and bad senses. So in her book, Suspicion, Charles studies black women and girls suspicion of the HPV vaccine in Barbados. So she cultivates here an appreciation of the multiple contingencies and sticky circulations of suspicion that shape hesitancy as a welcomingly fraught departure from a uh, point from which we might begin to reorient our understanding of post-colonial biopolitics. So to do this, she replaces the rhetoric of hesitancy that is bound up with a specific meta, uh, medico-juridicial framework 
that is hesitancy is framed as like a, a, something to be pathologized as being a sign of someone's lack of academic knowledge, their uh, lack of faith in science. And instead, she wants to get away from that to think about it in terms of suspicion, where she says that suspicion is to feel doubt, to withhold or resist feeling certain. And it is an understandable, effective response, given the histories of medical intervention in these areas. And there's so many examples of like the Tuskegee experiment, which is not in that context, but in like the United States where black men were used as guinea pigs to test the effects of syphilis on, on bodies, which is, of course, and there's so many examples continuing to this day of black people having a harder time, having a harder time actually actually accessing medical care and so on. And in Charles's book, she describes the many ways that black women's experiences and girls' experiences were discounted in the rollout of the HPV vaccine. Like there were ads put up of like thin looking white women being the subject of uh, various ads for the vaccine. And of course, this is this contributes to a rift between the public and the institutions that let's, you know, if we're being generous, you know, of course, they're trying to actually help these people. But it needs to be done with care and actual attention to these people, their specific histories, so as not to just treat them as being like uh, cognitively inferior or needing to just get over their fears or suspicions. So in her work, Charles doesn't focus on conspiracy theories. Like she's focusing on much uh, a much more specific thing in suspicion and uh, suspicion of the HPV vaccine. But her work reveals how effective and embodied utterances convey histories of systemic oppression. So when applied to conspiracy theories, her, theor her theoretical contribution supplies a necessary barometer with which we can use to distinguish uh, conspiracy theories that maintain a hegemonic status quo from those that challenge them. So by way of another theoretical method or really the theoretical lens that I apply here, I draw upon the work of Kelly Oliver, specifically her notion of witnessing, which acknowledges how people's experiences and people can communicate those experiences in ways that tr evade traditional forms of assessment and verification. So Oliver's approach to witnessing is useful for many reasons. Its two primary methodological considerations for me are its attendance to, number one, uh, its attendance to knowledge that goes beyond recognition and history, in her words, and how it joins the practice of witnessing and listening to a concerted effort to acknowledge the imbricating histories of oppression that may contextualize someone's testimony. So witnessing embraces this dual-pronged approach to distinguish witnessing from what she calls false witnessing, which is an ironic term because I'm trying to get away from like the true false binary uh, but, you know, this is just her term, so. Where she says that witnessing is the act of being with someone else's testimony and the context from which that testimony emanates. Even if its truth is not fully comprehensible to the listener. Like someone might be describing a conspiracy theory and I might, my initial impulse might be like, oh, well, that, that sounds like kooky, but, you know, we can't, that, there's no way that can be true. But what witnessing would allow instead is to be like, okay, let me understand this like as best I can from your perspective. Like what might actually be going on here if we like, maybe if we unpack this or if we uh, sat with it or tried to understand it beyond just its truthfulness. So the witness here uh, is in, con in contrast to the false witness, Kelly Oliver describes the false witness as someone who attempts to close off response from others, otherness or difference. So in doing so, the false witness assimilates the past and the present in order to deny the present effects of our racist past and render race irrelevant to the present, among other erasures. So like in the case of Nicole Charles's work in Barbados and on suspicion, if someone were to just be like, oh, well, you know, previous biomedical harms of the past against black people across the world, like doesn't matter. We're just focused on the now. And of course, that is the figure, that would be an example of a false witness who tries to just ignore uh, histories of oppression that in many cases might, it might implicate them if they're like a researcher too. Now the third and final chapter just applies this lens of witnessing to the music of, to the rap of Lauren Hill, KRS-One or Chris One and Immortal Technique, which I can't play here because I don't want to get copyrighted off the earth. But I draw upon these examples because as a musical genre, 
that has been historically policed and subjugated. Rap occupies a unique position as a medium to convey experiences of systemic oppression, a practice that resonates with the specific tributary of rap music called street consciousness rap, knowledge rap, political rap. It has many different uh, names. Now, there's a passage from, which is the next slide, uh, I would play a segment from one of Lauren Hill's tunes, but that would, uh, again, likely get copyrighted off the earth. So instead, I will just read out to you, for those of you listening, the uh, passage. The passage. It's, this is from her song, The Mystery of Iniquity. I go into a lot more detail about Lauren Hill and Lauren Hill's life and everything and her experiences within the criminal justice system. But here, I just take this example from the mystery of iniquity that it, it, in that it illustrates Hill's future experiences in the criminal justice system. So as she raps in her tune, the defense isn't making any sense. Faking the confidence of, escaping the consequence that a defendant is depending on the system, totally void of judgment, purposely made to twist them, emotional victim blackmailed by the henchmen, framed by intentions and inventions whereby the lynch, they lynch men, enter the false witness, slandering the accused, planting the seed openly, showing he's being used to discredit, edit, headed for the alleged, smearing the individual, fearing the unsuspected, expert witness, the paid authority, made a, as I cut off my own lyrics with my head. Uh, and it, it goes on. I didn't get, I didn't deliver it with the same rhythmic uh, fortitude as Lauren Hill. I definitely recommend you go listen to it. She's, um, the way she's able to uh, deliver her verses while playing guitar is, uh, it's commendable. It's very, she's, she has a ton of talent. Now, so in this case, the system, that is the term, the system, encapsulates the totality of injustices experienced or exercised against the society's most vulnerable. So she describes from paid off witnesses to crooked judges, to manipulating lawyers. She describes a cornucopia of conspirators that keep the system afloat. So to witness these claims, demands separating them from their empirical facticity and instead reckoning with the lived experiences conveyed in the words themselves. So by calling our attention to these malicious figures and their coordination across institutions, Hill's conspiracy theories reveal the persistence of injustice in the criminal justice system. Moreover, they highlight the interconnected web of powerful people, their academic background and their wealth. So like I mentioned earlier, this song the Mystery of Iniquity, illustrates Hill's future experiences in the criminal justice system. So following her arrest for tax evasion in 2013, a New York judge ordered that she serve three months in jail to undergo, in their words, counseling because of her conspiracy theories, including that artists are being oppressed by a plot involving the military and media. Interestingly, I found no example of Alex Jones being sentenced to mandatory counseling for his conspiracy theories, despite the irreparable and really like un, unaccount, unquantifiable harm that he's inflicted against so many people uh, that really cannot be quantified. He's never been institutionalized or, or <laughs> uh, ordered to be institutionalized. Now to justify her tax evasion, Hill cites the climate of hostility, false entitlement, manipulation and racial, racial prejudice, sexism and ageism within the music industry. In her words, over-commercialization and its resulting restrictions and limitations can be very damaging and distorting to the inherent nature of the individual. Hill claims that she distanced herself from society to raise her children in a setting that was free of these forces that she says were born out of the United States' legacy of slavery. In her words, I am a child of former slaves who had a system imposed on them. I had an economic system, system imposed on me. So it's unclear whether or not these words influence the judge's decision to institutionalize her, but the historical evidence behind her beliefs was absolutely not considered as a legitimate explanation for her views. That is, the actual history wasn't considered. The judge was just like, oh no, this is, we have to do away with this. It's, we have to pathologize Lauren Hill, of course. So her being pathologized as a conspiracy theorist places her squarely within the domain of subjugated knowledge that we started out with with Bradditch's work. But because there is a dearth of examples of defendants being ordered to attend counseling for espousing conspiracy theories, 
we have to ask why this happened to Lauren Hill specifically. So arguably, Lauren Hill is the victim of the same conspiracy panic or subjugated knowledge that the Warao people experienced, discussed in the last chapter. And But in this case, in order to contextualize this, we just have to look at the history uh, of the way that black women are treated in America, where they have been subject to institutional measures in order to silence them and any dissenting ideas born out of their experiences. So institutionalization transforms a systemic issue into an individual issue that can be corrected with the right medical intervention. So Nicole Rousseau observes that black women have been especially targeted by the black pathology myth. The myth of sickness among black women, uh, of, sorry, the myth of sickness among black people that causes failure in society, as though it is black women's fault for their own experiences of oppression and for other black people's experiences of oppression. So white policymakers take it upon themselves to intensify black people's incarceration and institu institutionalization rates in order to oppose their apparent efforts to overrun city streets. You know, they had they. They put in more stringent rules because they fear black people's retaliation, the, the idea that they will overrun city streets and change the face of the nation. So whether consciously or not, the judge in Hill's case or policymakers or whatever, uh, they belong to a long trajectory of oppression that has pathologized black women as unruly mothers and citizens in need of institutionalization, in need of policing, in need of correcting. So as a witness, I read Lauren Hill's music and experiences as one, an expression of the fraught relationship between artists and record labels intent on extracting as much value uh, from the artist as possible. And the nature of this exploitation does not change, even if, as Lauren Hill's, is, in the case of Lauren Hill, the artist is compensated well for their work. Like, of course, Lauren Hill is doing well <laughs> monetarily, but in any case, we can still point to these types of oppressions that she's experienced. So using the rhetoric of the conspiracy theory, to describe these exploitative practices illustrates a phenomenon that extends well beyond her experiences alone. So as a witness, the other way that I can read this or that I read this is as an effort to grapple with her repeated experiences of sexism and racism at the hands of critics and audiences alike who place disproportionate expectations on women artists of color. So when Hill uses her platform to describe conspiracies that target her and her talents, she is met with heavy resistance and institutionalization. By comparison, a similar use of conspiracy theories helped Donald Trump become president of the world's most powerful nation. So un uh, I, I also read this as an unapologetic criticism of the American justice and police system's rampant discriminatory practices. Her conspiracy theories and her personal experiences put a face to these unjust practices, opening the door for her listeners to identify these same forces in their lives. Now, in witnessing conspiracy theories, we may acknowledge the ways that they communicate truths and experiences that go beyond recognition in history, that are not necessarily verifiable with empirical tools and measures. And this isn't to say that empirical verification is invalid. We need it as well. We have to know how to you know, also hold people accountable with this. So this isn't also to avow all conspiracy theories, like I mentioned earlier. Of course, some can be used to maintain oppression. It isn't like a magical cure-all. And yeah, it would just, I, and that's pretty much it. I would like to conclude like by some, uh, yeah, that's pretty well it. Like if, you know, you like what I did, if you have any comments, I'd love to hear them or questions. If you see any problems with it, I'd love to hear about them. Uh, I'd all, I'm always going to be curious about how to make it better, the argument better. But yeah, this is what I delivered as a my public lecture. Um, yeah, if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, and stay tuned. I got some regular scheduled stuff coming up in the next few weeks. I'm not sure when I'll actually get to it, but hopefully soon. And yeah, hope you like this. And on that note, take care. If you know, follow me anywhere else that you'd like, send me a message, I don't mind. And yeah, on that note, take care.